Over the last few years, the digital revolution has completely trans transformed the way that we shop. And the beauty industry has been one of the biggest beneficiaries of that. So for our first session, I'm delighted to welcome Daniel Lang up from Parfum Dreams. And he's going to share a little bit about the story Hi. of how they grew into an omnichannel challenger. Why don't you grab a seat with me, yeah, Daniel? For sure. <laughs> I'll sit, sit there. Yeah, perfect. And then hopefully that's your picture. Great. Should I have to dodge away or it's okay for you guys? No, we know who you are now, it's great. Um, Daniel, you were one of the founding members of Parfum Dreams. Can you start just by telling us a little bit about your role and the journey that the business has taken? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, kind, kind of uh, yeah, founding partner or founding uh, colleague. Uh, in the end, um, I have to jump back to meanwhile studying. Um, I had a good friend of mine, uh, it was Kai Renchen, and Kai Renchen was the former founder and uh, yeah, uh, some of the owner family from Parfum React Center. And we had a couple of enterprises founded together, meanwhile studying, and yeah, all of them are not there anymore. So we, at least we know how to, how to not do it. And the last one was more or less Parfum Dreams, which he, yeah, he recently bought back in the days, uh, the web shop. And, we played around, it was around 2007, 2000, yeah, 2007, I guess, and then after finishing my studies in 2009, I had the idea of officially joining the enterprise, and yeah, since then I'm there and I'm not gone, and I don't have any plans to, to do so in the future. And yeah, since then I'm there, and in the beginning we started like, yeah, developing the whole web shop, doing customer support and all the stuff by our own, then with the, the kind of normal, let's say normal startup story. You, you, you're growing, you have to, to do some adaptions, some changes, you get more and more into details and processes and all this stuff. And yeah, around, I think it was 2018, we had the M&A going on with Douglas. And right now I'm still there, <laughs> even if I unfortunately didn't have shares back in the days, which was kind of a pity when the merger kicked in. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm uh, like I said, I'm still there and happy, happy to be there and don't plan to leave. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, when uh, Parfum Dreams first started, it, it took quite a novel approach to things like customer service with, um, I would say, very competitive um, returns policies. You experimented with using WhatsApp, for example, to deliver on customer service. How has that evolved over the last few years? Yeah, I would say in the beginning it wasn't about like being the, the tech marketing leader or whatsoever. So in the beginning it was more or less like yeah, being in the first grade of class, so running through it and have have fun uh, doing the stuff and seeing the development. And for sure in the beginning we saw our now our company mother Douglas as our main competitor because there weren't so many other players at least in our branch. And we tried to tackle them and we tried to compete with them. And for sure we played around and tested a lot of new features. But we really felt like, okay, we are, we are faster because we are small and we don't have to rely on so many, like I said, legal difficulties or whatsoever. So we never checked something that detailed that a normal corporate is doing. And then, to be honest, Flaconi came, came in the game and they literally changed our way of work because they were then the fast moving competitor. And so we said, okay, we have to do something against it. And, so there came like ideas of how to implement WhatsApp service and I think we were one of the first, at least in our branch in Germany or in Western Europe, we were the first one using this. In the beginning you still could use it as a marketing tool as well. Uh, and then later on Meta uh, didn't allow to do marketing activities anymore via WhatsApp. And the same was like, I guess it was even that Flaconi treated us to do it that way. So they expanded their uh, return delivery uh, days to 90 and then it was like kind of okay if they do 90 days we will do 180 let's wait and see and it was li literally like <laughs> fighting against each other and the positive thing is the the whole fight was maybe some from some perspective uh, to the disadvantages of us as the the retailers but all the time uh, in a positive direction of the customers in the end so yeah it was it was literally very often our competitors who are forcing us to be innovative and all that stuff. But back in the days, we really felt quite comfortable being the one who's trying to implement the newest thing. Right now, I would say we are not early adopters anymore. We are not first movers anymore, but we are still early adopters, kind of. Yeah. That's, that's a very honest response. Thank you so much for showing up. I mean, it's, it's nice to hear that 
that healthy competition has actually yeah. kept a level of innovation at industry level as well. Um, and I just want to stay with that idea of agility that you mentioned at the beginning of your response, because obviously the pandemic has had a huge impact on your category. I mean, the beauty category has remained incredibly resilient and there were new behaviours and new routines that customers and consumers adopted. Have you seen some of those trends and new ways of um, reaching the consumer um, remain following, following the pandemic and, and the relaxation of lockdown? Somehow, yes. Uh, in the end, um, when I compare the way of work we are doing right now with the time of the beginning of the pandemic and even before, we always were very good and very keen of uh, getting new customers in our shop. So all this paid traffic and all that stuff was something we all the time did more or less. And then for sure, COVID kicked in. And this thing completely changed in 2022 somehow, uh, at least in the later, later, later months of 2022. And I guess all you guys heard about it or read about it somewhere. Um, that plenty of enterprises changed their way of how to spend money and try to save money and pay more or have a more detailed look on margin and contribution, all that stuff, and less on the only ad spend and net sales. And yeah, so we did as well some in some ways, but we are still thinking about, okay, how to get in customers in our, in our shop. So this part, this paid channel never changed really, um, but we are focusing a lot more Nowadays, on yeah, customer loyalty, on CLVs, on how to get the CRM, yeah, I would say it's kind of being operational excellent. So this is the way we are looking at right now. Back in the days, it was more about okay, okay, how could we thrill or uh, bring the conversion rate up to X Y Z percent even on the first contact? And now it's more or less like okay, how could we keep the customer for a longer time being around with us and keep them more loyal? So this is the. I would say the major change we had, and I think it's counting for a lot of other enterprises as well. Thanks so much. And obviously now you're expanding into more touch points with um, both physical and digital uh, touch points available to the consumer. But I'm curious because the, the category itself of beauty and, and fragrances is, is a tangible category, it's a sensory category. How do you create a, a marketing and customer experience to get the customer so engaged with the category that you would normally have to touch and smell in order to appreciate it. Yeah, so if I would have the perfect solution, I would think I uh, would create a uh, consultant agency for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in the end, um, on the one hand, it's a really cool category because we are the perfect replenishment case. In the moment you know which fragrance you're rooting for or which makeup fits perfectly your needs, you have to buy it somewhere. And if we make it easy for you guys to, to, to purchase it online within two, four, five clicks and get it on the next day, it's a piece of cake to do so. And uh, we are all, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't take us a lot of effort to, to, to get to this point. But, and this is the main challenge, how to get new products or new innovations, new ideas, uh, and also a lot of content uh, uh, really content with, a, with added value to the customer to, to keep them in the web shop, so to not only be the replenishment case. And this is the most difficult thing, and we are really looking forward, and like I said in the beginning, we are not the first mover anymore, but uh, saw in the WWDC uh, stuff with uh, the, the Apple glasses uh, going on, and thinking about XR, VR, AR, and how to implement it in the app and in the web shop could be something which will bring us even closer to the customer and to the customer journey, the experience um, with virtual try-on, which already exists and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the major thing we are working on is to bring the product, which is in our opinion, or database-driven uh, uh, idea, which is missing for the customer in the perfect moment to the customer, not while offering him uh, the product with a, with a price off, but telling him like, hey, this is your journey. You normally need these five products uh, to, to, uh, to add on or to, to mix them. So like you're, you take your zero, you take your night, night cream, day cream, whatever, and this particular part is still missing. We have it, we can supply it with, and then your, your complete uh, uh, routine is perfect and all set. And, we are here to help you, so we are reaching out, helping, and being the the, the cool and uh, the cool, the cool uh, advisor uh, from above the corner. And uh, we are not the one trying to sell it to you, but we can definitely help you if you have any other questions. And this is 
more or less the, the way uh, we develop or we see ourselves developing away from just being the replenishment case, just being there with good prices and that's it. More in direction of, okay, what else could we offer you? What else could we do to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel happy? So that relationship building and clienteling is a very important element then. Um, and you touched preemptively on a couple of um, tools that you're starting to experiment with, things like AR, VI tech. What other technology tools are helping to fuel the rapid expansion of Parfum Dreams now? Imazis. <laughs> Full stop. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> no. For sure, we are exper experimenting around with uh, the, uh, the, the open AI or ChatGPT for sure as well on our side. And yeah, having like all this augmented reality stuff going on like for three or four years back in the days, we, we experimented around. And uh, nowadays, we really see, yeah, data is yeah, nothing new as well. Data is the new gold uh, somehow, and uh, you have to. to be not only the, the owner of your data, but you, be the per, you have to be the perfect processor of it, and you have to gain valuable insights out of them, and so therefore you need a big data warehouse combined with a good marketing solution, marketing engine, and this is where MRS really kicks in, uh, so that you can really play around or combine all the different channels, all different touch points at the right time. And yeah, despite all this new fancy stuff out there, and there are plenty of tools with uh, deep skin analysis via AR and algorithms and stuff like that. You have to have like a tool which perfectly combines the orchestration of the different channel, uh, channels and this is where Emaz is literally helping us in all the time. Amazing. And I mean obviously that's quite, been quite a strong partnership for you and it sounds like as the business has grown, collaboration has played a really important role in strengthening the business as well. Can you just dive a little bit into some of those partnerships and other collaborations that have helped to fuel growth? Yeah, so in the end there are like a couple of partnerships which literally stand out, I would say. On, on the one hand, for sure, it's our uh, industrial partners where we are partnering with. So speaking about the L'Oreal's, the Elvire and the Chanel's of this world. Uh, where you have like long-term partnerships for sure since <laughs> we need to get the, pro the products uh, on the one hand. Um, but yeah, you, you can deep dive with them and uh, thinking, building think tanks about okay, what, what could be the next products or what could be the next technical implementation from their side as well. Uh, 12 years ago, we spoke about iframe implementation of product finders and whatsoever. Uh, this is the one part of the of the story, and the other part uh, is for sure uh, tech-related uh, partnerships. Like, don't know, don't want to do name dropping here, but you need someone doing perfect retail media stuff on site, or you have to do you have to find someone who's really good in helping you optimizing retargeting campaigns. Then, yeah, for sure, you have to partner somehow with Meta and the other big ones. Uh, you can discuss about how if it's really a partnership on eye to eye basis, I wouldn't think so, uh, since they are too big and we are too small. Um, but uh, yeah, also in the end, uh, if you ask me for which is the, the most crucial partner, and I'm just, I'm doing tech and marketing, but uh, now I'm speaking only from a marketing perspective. If you ask me who's the most valuable partner for me to get the marketing flywheel, yeah, keeping on, it once again will be a Marcus since they are doing SMS implementation, push notes, on-site pushes, email, print mailing, automations, everything, and it's more or less aggregated all in one. For sure, then there, like, you have uh, uh, behind, behind all your initial marketing activities, you need partners for post-purchase uh, com uh, communication to your, to your customer, you need someone for having, like, uh, getting net promoter scores to know what's, to, to, not, to not only receive the negativity via customer support when something doesn't work, but to, only, to also understand um, how, how, how happy, how satisfied are your customers. And yeah, in the end it's just a number, but you can start to interpret these number, numbers. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said in the beginning, um, we are now working, Philip, maybe you can help me, but I think it's like 12 years, 10 years, something around that, with the Marses, and we try to do it with literally every partner we have, because uh, maybe I'm, not willing to change anymore with uh, at the age of 38, I don't know. Uh, but, I, but I like having long-term uh, partnerships because it makes it a lot easier to, to discuss really openly uh, even yeah, negative issues with each other. Yeah, and also if something's working well, you don't need to fix it, right? Um, you, you mentioned using data and feedback to kind of quickly understand any kind of problems or opportunities that you have. And 
Parfum Dreams has expanded its territories um, internationally um, recently. So as you've been doing that, have you encountered any challenges as you've been entering new markets? How have you had to localize your strategy to ensure that you're, you're relevant to new consumers? More than just a couple of months, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the end, it's, it's, uh, it's already a couple of years ago when we started doing international, internationalization. I think we started around 2011 or 2012 with uh, getting the web shop being translated to English and then roll it out step by step in other countries. And nowadays we are uh, working or we, we are active in uh, 16 countries. And uh, this was even before having the m &A going on with Douglas. Um, and we had this, so we are from down south Germany. We are from, uh, we are from nearby Stuttgart. and. Uh, the Schwaben have this idea of doing everything by their own. We are ne never buying anything. We are trying to invent it from scratch new, Why so for whatsoever reason. And we did this exactly with our internationalization. So we thought, okay, it might be a good idea to have our own uh, backend system, our own yeah, uh, fulfillment and shipping system. So we, cre we created literally everything from scratch. And it was a cool idea. And then we also thought it might could be a cool idea to just take the, the really necessary uh, things like the terms and conditions and like, uh, I don't know, your, your impress, impressi, impressum, I don't know, imprint, imprint, thanks, uh, your imprint and translate only this, for example, in Czech language, and then roll out the shop. So there was still eau de parfum, uh, eau de toilette and shower gel in it. Uh, and then we started like, it was kind of bootstrap. So you started with a really tiny portion of translation having no localization, having no payment methods which are necessary in particular countries. And then it was like doing it step by step. And if you ask me what I would do else nowadays, I would definitely take more money in the first step to have a way better, way or more proper setup in a specific country and then start with a big bang instead of doing this guerrilla like uh, we, we, we start there slow and nobody is aware of, then maybe we start with doing some PLA and then let's wait and see how it works and if it develops then we can throw more money on it. So it's more or less, we, we did the opposite case from, for example, about you, which uh, Tarek Müller uh, a couple uh, recently or a couple of times already mentioned, like doing everything they can and then uh, entering a new country with a big bang, uh, throwing seven, seven digit ad spend on it within the first week or stuff like that. We, on the one hand, we never had the money. On the other hand, we never had, uh, yeah, we, we, are nev we, we were never, we never, felt that way. So we really said, okay, let's keep it small, keep it close. We are, we are like, we are feeling like this little town, Asterix and Obelix, surrounded by the, by, by, uh, uh, the rest of the world, so Douglas and all the others. And that's why, that was the way how we started uh, working in a specific country. But this leads in the direction that you are still focusing heavily on your home country, because there you are doing the bigger numbers. And it sometimes can lead to the situation that you more or less don't pay so much attention to new, new rolled out countries like you should do. So this is more or less the difficulty. I would change definitely today. Okay, thank you so much. Again, a very honest answer about some of the challenges when you're trying to build that cultural resonance as well. Um, what have been some of the biggest marketing highlights then for you? Every year, Black Friday with my team, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, with the beginning of, or today it's even Singles Day, so with the beginning of the 10th or 11th uh, of November, I normally, I, will, I can do whatever I want, I will not get sick until the 24th of December, and then I can bet on money on it that I will get sick. It's every year the same stuff, but it's okay, and the um, positive thing is my team is feeling kind of the same way. And we are, we are, we are standing there uh, back to back uh, and walking through these crazy times with each other. And if you're asking me for what is my, one of my biggest things or the, one of the things I can remember and I really, uh, yeah, I really like uh, thinking back to these parts, it was the first time doing the McDonald's Monopoly thing back in the days where we spread like, I don't know, 30 million of vouchers and stuff like that. It was crazy for us. And the second biggest thing was our first TV flight when we did television ads back in the days. Uh, and this was like seeing how all that stuff works, how you create uh, a, t a television ad and all that stuff was. These were like, the, from a marketing perspective, these two parts or these three parts are the biggest, biggest things I, I love to think about or to, to, to remember. And yeah, for the good part, the good part is uh, Black Friday, Singles Day and Xmas. I, 
I, I can look forward to it for this year already, once again. Amazing. Well, some, some awesome milestones that you've been able to map up. We're almost out of time, but just sticking with that, what's the next big milestone that you're looking forward to at Parfum Dreams? Okay. If you, if you ask me like that, I want to see, and it's not a really big milestone, but uh, we are struggling since one and a half years to get in TikTok uh, or <laughs> running. So my big milestone would to see, okay, when will comes the day where we uh, are able to have like 500K of followers and uh, the first videos with 10 or 20 million of views. This is one part, but on a, on a higher level, on a higher perspective, I would say, uh, there are some, some other countries in Europe which we are not active yet, so this could be a bigger milestone to, to work on.